It's an honor and a pleasure to be back again in uh, Bet Gavriel, where, Baruch Hashem, I've been here numerous times. Actually, I think this is the first time I'm upstairs. I think all the other times we were downstairs. But the Kedushah, the holiness, is uh, from the roof to the basement, so it's all fine and good. Uh, the topic tonight is uh, Torah Misenai. The topic tonight is the, our Torah is did Sinai really happen, our emuna, our faith, our everything, our fundamental understanding of Hashem and the Torah is based on Sinai. Now, let's start with the idea of how people make decisions. People make decisions always based on evidence. Has anybody here uh, been to China? Nobody. Does everybody know there's a place called China? Yeah. How do you know? Not been there. Nobody's been there, but everybody nodded their head. Yeah, yeah, sure. We know this China. Yeah, yeah. How do you know? If you've never been there, maybe it's a fake. Maybe it's a hoax. The answer is, you'll tell me, what do you mean? It's on the internet. It's on the maps. You go into a toy store and there's a hundred different products, say, made in China. There's people all over the streets of New York who were born in China or their parents were born in China. It's in the news all the time. It's a big country, has 1.2 billion people. So what are you basically saying? You're basically saying that you know China exists based on evidence. And this idea is a gigantic idea, not in Judaism, but in everyday life. Everybody does things and makes decisions and knows things based on evidence. In the jury system in the United States, where you have a jury sitting there and somebody's accused of robbing the bank, the prosecuting attorney says this, 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 oh, we got a picture of him robbing the bank on the bank camera, and we have witnesses that saw him running out of the bank with the money, and we found the bank money in his trunk of his car with his fingerprints on it, and the DNA sample that we got from him because he cut his hand on the way out, and we got a DNA sample, matches him, and the jury says guilty, because it's what they call beyond a reasonable doubt. All decisions we make work the same way, beyond a reasonable doubt. When tonight's beautiful, wonderful Chazak activity was advertised, how did you know for sure it was going to be a Chazak Torah lecture? Maybe it was going to be a Tupperware party, or, you know, an Amway sales pitch or something. The answer is your evidence said that, you know, experience is that when they call you, when they get a flyer like this, that it's always been a... Torah program, it's going to be now a Torah program also. If you apply to a college or a university and you've never seen the university but you send in an application with a registration check, how do you know the place exists? They have an inter internet site. Well, maybe the internet site is fake. We don't work with this kind of ideas. We work always with the idea of if I have enough evidence, I know something is true. A jury will say guilty if there's enough evidence to convict the person. Everyone here said China exists, certainly. That's how we live our lives. Based on that idea that we decide things based on evidence and based on what we see and based on our reasoning and seichel and understanding, so anyone who wants to open their eyes can see in one minute that there is Hashem. That there is a bore, a creator, umman hig, and running the world. How do you see that? You get up in the morning, and the sun is there, and the earth is moving, and the earth is rotating around the sun, takes it exactly 365 days to do it. It doesn't slow down, it doesn't speed up. While it's going around the sun, it's also turning on its own axis, and it makes a complete turn every 24 hours, exactly. Not like a dreidel, a sivivon, that you turn on Hanukkah, and as soon as you let it go, it starts slowing down. This doesn't work like that. The earth keeps on going at the exact same speed, unlike somebody driving their car. 
As soon as they let their foot up from the gas pedal, the car immediately starts to slow down. In order for the car to keep on going at the exact same speed, somebody's foot has to be on the gas pedal. In order for the world to keep on going at the exact same speed, 365 days around the sun, every 24 hours on its own axis, somebody has to be pressing the gas. Somebody has to be manhig, be the nahag, be the driver of this, giving it its power having created it and maintaining it. On planet Earth, this life is so complex. There's air, carbon dioxide, and animals, and water, and it rains, and the soil gives out these funny things that we eat, and it sustains us. And there's such a balance and a diversity of life on planet Earth that's maintained. And the Earth, as it goes, it has seasons. It has the seasons because while it's turning like this and like this, it's also tilting this way and that way toward the sun and away from the sun. So we have longer days and shorter days, summer and winter. And it never gets closer to the sun or we'd fry. And it never goes further from the sun because we'd freeze. We're exactly 93 million and approximately miles from the sun. If it would be a million miles or two million miles closer or two million miles further, whatever the amounts are, it would be too cold or too hot. And this is only one little drop of what our planet is and our universe is in complexity and diversity. Evidence says, where did this come from? Who's maintaining it? It happened by itself? Imagine, I would tell you, you see that airplane at JFK Airport? Big 747? You know how it got there? There was a tornado in Alabama. And the tornado in Alabama was this huge storm, it picked up pieces of metal and rubber and lead and paint and, 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 and wood and iron and steel and aluminum and, and it picked up trees and cars and it picked up all kinds of materials and grass and houses and bricks and it was blowing all over the place and the mill winds were blowing all the way to New York. And they got to New York, the winds subsided. All that debris came tumbling down from the sky. And it landed in a perfect format that you got wheels here, wings, entrance door, seats marked A through C and D through F with 40 rows. And they're all marked exactly perfectly in place. It has electricity. It has bathrooms. It has a kitchen. It has a seat for a pilot. It's full of jet fuel, 24,000 gallons of jet fuel. And the electricity is on. And there's an air conditioning system. And it all happened from the tornado that blew all this stuff. And it all landed and came together. In Hebrew, you'd call me Mishuga, <laughs> Crazy. That's not possible. How, somebody had to have put it together. It can't happen by itself. Well, guess what? A 747 in JFK Airport is nothing in complexity compared to the world. Compared to the smallest thing in the world. Happened by itself? Evidence is staring at us screaming at us. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, there's a creator here, there's a Bore, there's a Manhig, there's something behind this. You can't, unless you're Mechusad Daya, a crazy person, actually think it happened by itself. Where did the space come from? Where did the energy come from? Where did the light come from? People say, oh, the primitive world, it had evolution. Evolution? Trillions and trillions of mutations that instead of being mutations ended up perfections to have a world like this? Ask a statistician about the possibility of such a thing, they'll laugh at you. And where did the original 
matter come from? Even the most primitive matter. Basically, anybody that has any kind of thought processes sees clearly yesh borei umanhig. There's a creator and a sustainer. Hashem Yisborach. Now, this is so simple that I don't have to be in a Bet Knesset in a shul to say it. I could say this on the subway too. You've seen people on the subway sometimes making speeches. You ever see them? Yeah? I could say this on the subway too. Because anybody on planet Earth, Jewish, not Jewish, old, young, whatever, who is thinking sees this clearly. What they don't see as clearly is that this Borei Umanhig, this supreme creator that is beyond our understanding and beyond our imagination, but we can only understand the creator based on the creation, us and everything around us, has a purpose to this world. That not everybody gets. Anybody thinking says, yes, there's a creator, Creator is maintaining everything here, obviously. Evidence clearly indicates that, hands down. But does the Creator want something from us? So we as Jews say, of course, certainly the Creator wants something from us. The Creator wants to give us an opportunity to refine our neshamot. He gives us the opportunity that into our plain Bodies, we put some kind of thing we call a neshama, a soul, a feeling, something that has feelings, emotions, intellect, understanding, striving, yearns for meaning. Only humans have that. Giraffes, horses, they yearn for supper and going to sleep. If a human is yearning for supper and going to sleep, all they are is a fancy horse. <laughs> Nothing more. We humans look for meaning. But the average person has no clue where do I get the meaning from. But Hashem created this beautiful complex world and created human beings. And the human beings He created different than the monkeys, the giraffes, the dogs, the cats, the trees, the grass. Because we have this higher intellect and understanding there has to be something more. He gave us this extra, extra capability because that gives us the ability to look for Bokhato, Bokhayim, Torah, and Mitzvot. There's 6.3 billion people though on planet Earth who most of them don't know that the key to the Torah and Mitzvot was given to the world at Har Sinai on Shavuos 3,000 plus years ago. They also don't know that the original intent of the Rabbono Shalom of Hashem was to give the Torah to Adam and Chava, to Adam and Eve. The idea was not that there should be one group of people that are close to Hashem and get close to Torah. The idea was it should be for everyone. What happened? What happened? Hashem gave Adam and Chava one mitzvah. Don't eat the fruit of that tree. They couldn't handle it. He's going to give them 613? Impossible. So the original plan of Torah for all mankind had to wait. Maybe there'll be a better opportunity. And everything went downhill. Till Noah with the Mabul, with the flood. And Nimrod and idol worship. Until Avraham came along. And Avraham was the first one. Oh, new world is not stones and sticks and stupidity. There's something higher. And Avraham's descendants, little by little, through that Mitzrayim experience and the emergence from Mitzrayim, came to a point where the Torah describes us as Vayichan Yisrael, the Jewish people were encamped, singular, not Vayachanu, plural, but Vayichan, singular. There was a unique occurrence at Har Sinai where the people were together like one with one 
mind, with one heart, with a connection, with achdut, with brotherhood, with friendship, with love between themselves and to Hashem, now is the opportunity. And Hashem gave the Torah at that time. He took us out of Mitzrayim on Pesach. He took Mitzrayim out of us on Shavuos at Har Sinai. It says it in the Torah. On the third day in the morning, the entire nation was brought out. They stood at the foot of Mount Sinai. They heard, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, I am the Lord your God, Aseret HaDibrot. They saw that Hashem appointed Moshe as a musmach, as his, his messenger on earth, in front of two and a half million Jews at Har Sinai. That was the Jewish population then. We know the Jewish population because there were 600 males, approximately, of military age, double it for the women, children, seniors, you got about two and a half million people at Har Sinai. And they hear, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, and they see, and they experience it themselves, each individual. They can be assured that they're not hallucinating because there's another two million, two and a half million people with them in this experience. It's not a dream. It's not listening to somebody else. It's not somebody else claiming they heard a prophecy, they heard a voice, they're a messenger. No, they heard it themselves. And on Shavuos, this year, as every year, we celebrate this fantastic, fantastic event. What is our evidence that it really happened? Here's our evidence, part of our evidence. There's two ways that Hashem can communicate with people. One way is make a big mass divine national revelation like Sinai and talk to the entire nation. That way everyone hears the voice of Hashem and everyone hears the commandments and there's no doubts and there's no belief and there's no faith. It's a, an experience. It's like Lahavdil. Somebody goes with their family to Niagara Falls. They're there. They put on their raincoats. They go in the boat. They go under the falls. They stand on top of the falls, on the side of the falls, next to the falls. They take a picture here, a picture here, a picture there. It was a personal experience. It's not that they're hearing from somebody else. Oh, you're sitting in Forest Hills, but you should know 400 miles away is Niagara Falls, and the water is falling down, and there's boats. Do I believe him? Do I not believe him? I don't know. I haven't been there. But if I'm there, I know it. That's the Jewish experience. Now, this, as I said, two ways of Hashem communicating with people. One is that way. What's the other way? The other way Hashem finds one person, maybe a Novi, a prophet, maybe an exalted person, and comes to that person and says, you're hearing a nevuah, you're hearing a prophecy. Here's my prophecy to you, spread the word to everyone. And we do have neviim. Yeshayahu, Yirmiyahu, Yecheskel, Shmuel HaNavi, we have neviim, we have prophets. But when it came to giving the Torah, Hashem did not go to any prophets. Not even to the best of all prophets, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses himself. Hashem brought us all together, everyone should hear. Why? Because these two methods, one is much better than the other. It's much better to hear in person, within a mass human setting. Anochi Hashem Elokecha, I am Hashem. Remember the Shabbos, honor your parents, don't murder, don't kidnap than to hear it from some private person who comes in one day and says, Hi, I am the Navi. Hashem came to me last night and said to tell everyone that he is Hashem. And he says, Zachor et Yom HaShabbat, remember Shabbat. And you say, you really, Hashem really spoke to you last night? Certainly. Yes, no, I don't know. Do I trust him? Don't I trust him? Clearly, 
the better way, if Hashem wants to give us instructions, give us a Torah, the better way is the way it was done at Sinai. It's so much more believable, so much more superior, so much more real than having to rely on a Navi. And that's why Hashem did it like that. How do we know it happened? Here's how we know. There are many, many religions in the world. In fact, somebody told me there's over a thousand world religions. Somebody told me that out west in the United States, there's actually a man named Bob who made his own religion. And he called it Bobism. Supposedly he wanted to name it after his wife, Judy, but the name was taken already. So he went with his own name, Bobism. 1,500 religions in the world. How many religions make a claim of national revelation? How many religions make a claim that God came and spoke to the entire nation, the entire people, in our case, two and a half million? How many religions make that claim? Only one. Only the Jewish people. There is no other religion in the world that claim that their starting point is that the entire religious group the entire national group, the entire group, whatever you want to define the group, stood at the foot of a mountain or stood somewhere on planet Earth and they heard the word of Hashem directly from Hashem. No one makes that claim except us in our Torah, Shemot, Perek Yutes, Perek Chof, Exodus chapter 19, 20, open up the Chumash, open up the Bible, you see it. Question, if that's the best way to start a religion, why doesn't every religion claim such an event? Claim it. Uh, claim that in the year, who knows what, the founder of our religion plus two and a half million people, I won't use names, all standing in Jerusalem, in Mecca, in Rome, in wherever you want, and the sky opened up and they heard, I am the Lord your God who told you to be this and this religion, your day of worship is this day, Friday, Sunday, Wednesday, this, that. Nobody makes that claim. Why not? It's the best way to start a religion. It's so much better than saying one person had a experience with God, and now you've got to believe that one person. So why doesn't every other religion not have a story like ours? There should be a story in every religion that starts with, like we have it. Oh, God came and showed himself to all the people. The words in the Torah, The sound of the shofar got louder and louder and the entire mountain was trembling and all the people heard. That's our story. It's fantastic, it's tremendous, it's the best way for Hashem to communicate. Everyone else should claim the same kind of story within their own religion, their own history, their own framework, their own starting point. Nobody does. Why? Even if it didn't happen. You want your religion to be good? Make it up. They don't. They don't. No one does. No, they didn't make it up that way. The other religions, it took them like a few hundred years to make up. But we're talking about the starting point. The starting point in any other religion, whether it be Christianity, Islam, or anywhere else, starts with one person claiming that the deity that God spoke to him and told everybody to do X, Y, Z. That's not a great start. I have to believe this person. What if this person's lying? What if he's a Meshuggahner? What, what, what? I, 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 there's no credibility. It's blind faith. He might be telling the truth. He might not be. Isn't it better just write like we wrote? Everyone saw, everyone heard. Somebody could argue maybe we didn't have it either, but we were smart enough to write such a nice story. And Shavuos, we read it and we get all excited. How do you know it's real? Why doesn't anybody else claim it? Why doesn't anybody else have such a start? That's the giant question. The answer is so, so simple. It's astonishing. 
Here's the answer. An event like Har Sinai, if it did not happen, you cannot claim that it happened, you cannot write it in your book, you cannot get away with a claim like that if it's not true. It's too big an event to fake in history or to retrofit in history. It's too giant an event. And because of that, no one else makes that claim because you can't get away with it. And I can give you a perfect example here in Queens to understand it. I'm sure everybody here is slightly aware of United States history. You know, 1776, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, they wrote the Declaration of Independence, Constitution, they fought the British, Philadelphia was the first, well I don't know if it was the first, but one of the first capitals of the United States before they moved it to later to Washington. Everybody knows approximate history. I want to tell you the true history of the United States. You ready for this? In 1776, Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, and two and a half million Pennsylvanians were standing in Center City, downtown Philadelphia. And suddenly, there was thunder and lightning, and a great sound of the shofar was blowing, and the entire Philadelphia was trembling, and the two and a half million people standing there heard, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, I am the Lord your God who is taking you out from under King George of England and making you the independent country, United States of America, Mazel Tov. <laughs> That's the true history of the United States of America. Why are you looking at me funny? <laughs> Maybe that's true. It's 250 years ago or something, right? You weren't born yet. Your grandparents weren't born yet. Your great-grandparents weren't born yet. Your great-great-great-grandparents may have been born already, but they were, they, were, they were in Russia somewhere. They weren't in New York or Philly. Maybe that happened. How do you know that didn't happen? Very simple. If that would have happened, you wouldn't need me Eliyahu Bergstein in 5771 in 2011 in Forest Hills to let you know about it. If that would have happened, every American from Maine to California would know about it. It would be an event passed down in the history of the United States. You know what happened in 1776? Wow, our leaders and our Pennsylvanians all heard God's voice declaring us. You know, that's why we write in God we trust on the dollar bills because we all had this great revelation of divinity. Nobody says that. And if I come and try and say that now, you left me out of this synagogue because it's impossible. How do you know about it? Nobody else knows about it. You know about it. How do you know about it? Where do you get this idea from? If that really happened, we would have all heard about it. That's why no one makes a claim like we have in our Chumash, like we have in our Torah of we stood at Sinai, two and a half million people, we heard the voice of Hashem. They can't make the claim. Because if it didn't happen, any time you try to make a claim about a gigantic event that didn't happen, people are going to say, what are you talking about? It can't be. If you try to make that claim during the generation of its actual happening, people say, we were there, it never happened. And if you try to make the claim 500 years later, or 200 years later, or 2,000 years later, the answer is impossible that it happened, the way you're saying it, because if it would have, we'd have known about it already. I'll give you one more example. You heard about Napoleon? Not the cake at the weddings. <laughs> I'm talking about the emperor, yeah? Okay, the great emperor Napoleon, French emperor, conquered half of Europe, conquered half of Russia. 
You heard of him. I hope you also heard of the even greater French emperor who came after Napoleon, who ruled for twice as long as Napoleon, who conquered the entire world and ruled the world for 60 years and forced everyone to wear purple slippers because he loved purple. The great Bafuftia. How do you know that Napoleon is real and Bafuftia is my demented imagination? Very simple. Everybody heard of Napoleon. You can't fake a great French emperor. He existed. It's in history. It's a known thing, not just in France, but in the entire world. World events. Bafuftia? The great emperor Bafuftia obviously never existed. Because if I, Bergstein, try to claim such a person here in 2011 in the Forest Hills Shul, and nobody, not in France or anybody else in the entire world, ever heard of this man, you say, Bergstein, you're hallucinating. If there would have been such a man, the same way we heard of Napoleon, we'd have heard of Bafuftia. It works the same way with the Torah. If actually there would have been a great, giant, divine revelation to any other religion, the same way the whole world heard about Sinai, they would have heard about those too. But they didn't. Because it didn't happen. And nobody tries to claim it. Even though those other religions would love to claim it, because it's certainly a much better start than one person saying, God came to me. Believe me, I'm telling you, I, I, I'm, I'm real, I'm real. Follow me. Why? Where? What a difference between every other religion and Yiddishkeit. The fact that it's there in the Torah, recorded, known to the entire world, singular and unique in history, is the most giant evidence of its MS. And it makes our Shavuot into a monumental day. And it actually makes every day of the year when we have our Torah monumental. Gigantic. Actually, other religions also have a Mesorah. Also have... You know, their parents, grandparents, great-grandparents up the line tell them, you know, we have our also traditions going back, going back, going back. Are their traditions true or are they false? Are our traditions true or false? The answer is, our traditions are true and theirs are true also. How do you like that? But what are they saying? What they're saying is, my dear children, we believe because it was handed down from our parents, whatever their religion happens to be. And we, their parents believe because it was handed down by their parents, and their parents, and theirs, and theirs, and theirs. Till we get to where? To the first parents, at the time the religion was founded. And what will those first parents, the great, 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 great parents say, why do we have this religion? Because this man, Mr. A, B, C, J, M, whoever. This man says that God came to him and God told him to spread the world. This is the religion. So what are they actually saying and passing down to the other generations? They're passing down this idea that we believe in that person. Is there any way to verify it? No. Some religions don't even want to verify it. Blind faith is the best thing. Our religion, we go up to our parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, we go up the line all the way to the great-great-great-grandparents who were at Moses, with Moses at Sinai. And what are they saying? We heard Hashem. I, with my own ears, heard Hashem. I'm standing there and I feel the ground rattling. I hear the divine worse voice, Anoichi Hashem Alekecha. I believe something. I don't believe anything. I know it. You believe you're in this room now? You know you're in this room. 
our Yiddishkeit, our Yahadut, our Judaism is not even going back to a point of belief. It's actually going back to a point of knowledge and experience. It's no different, Lahavdil, than I know President Kennedy was shot. I know the United States was founded in 1776. I know Richard the Lionheart had, uh, had, was the general of the Crusades in 1096, a thousand years ago. I know that we stood at Sinai and heard Hashem's voice. It's not anymore anything to do with belief. Two more points. What if somebody says to you, yes, the founders of other religions don't claim that God spoke to everyone, but it's not blind faith because the founders of religion A, B, C, or whatever it is, all showed miracles. They did miracles to show that they were really, you know, authentic. There's two things about that. Number one, I don't know if they really did miracles or they didn't do miracles. This could be later fabrications. Again, there's no verification to that. And then I'll tell you even something bigger. Miracles are nothing. There was a famous magician in New York whose name was Houdini. You heard of him, right? He was actually Jewish. His real name, I think, was Weiss. <laughs> he died in 1933. You can look him up in the encyclopedia or in the internet. Harry Houdini was such a fantastic magician, he lived in New York, that he was actually able to do things that nobody could understand till today. One of the things he was able to do is the New York City Police Department could chain him in chains, handcuff him in locked handcuffs, gag him with a gag, put him on lead shoes, and throw him into the East River. And four or five minutes later, Houdini would come to the surface... The chains are off, the handcuffs are off, the gag is off, and he's here. To this day, no one knows how Houdini did these things. Now, imagine that I'm standing there on the banks of the East River in Queens or Manhattan when Houdini does this. And Houdini comes out of the water, and he gets out, and he's standing next to me, and he says to me, Bergstein, you see what I did? And I say, whoosh. I'm impressed, wow. Well, let me tell you, I'm able to do this miracle because I am the messenger of God and God told me from now on you should do Shabbat on Tuesday. You know what I say to Mr. Houdini? Mr. Houdini, I am so impressed with your abilities. I am so impressed with your ability to get out of those chains. I don't know how you did it. Maybe you're tricking me. Maybe it's magic. Maybe I'm being fooled. Maybe they weren't real chains, but they were really plastic nothing that the police department and you are in cahoots with to fool me. And maybe you really did something miraculous and you have powers and abilities beyond mine and you are something special. That does not give you any license to tell me that supposedly whatever you say after that is the word of God. The fact that I am impressed and can't explain your abilities is a standalone. And afterwards, what you tell me is God's message to me is a standalone. The fact that you're able to do this and I can't explain it and I might be impressed with it doesn't mean that, okay, since I can do that, now everything I say for the rest of my life is the word of God. Two separate things. I'm impressed, I can't explain it, but that doesn't give you any license. And in fact, I would say that that's why, even in our own Judaism, it was Har Sinai. It was the giving of the Torah at Har Sinai that made us a Am, that was Mechayevos requiring us to do mitzvot. Not before. Even though before we saw Paro got ten makot, and we saw the sea split, we saw some great miracles. In fact, you could say those miracles were more impressive than Sinai. Sinai, hear God's voice. Those are, oh, spreading the sea, ten makot on Paro. 
Miracles, makot, fine and good. But to actually send the message, it can't be through miracles. It has to be through Hashem's communication. Problem, one problem is left. This is wonderful, beautiful. It is a gigantic piece of evidence. It separates Judaism from everything else by miles. Because basically we're not basing anything we're doing on faith. We're not basing anything we're doing on belief. Everything is based on facts. It's no different the fact that your parents will tell you, we used to live in the Bronx, and now we live in Forest Hills. You don't remember the Bronx, but your parents are telling you they were in the Bronx. Our parents are telling us that their parents, their parents, their parents, their parents, up to the parents, were at Mount Sinai. Period. It's a fact handed down. Gigantic piece of information. If I tell this to non-religious audiences, I tell them you better think about it for a while. Because it is such a magnificent piece of information that if you don't think about it, you're going to lose it. Yeah, how many words did we actually hear from God alone and whatever was... Uh, According to this, uh, uh, various opinions... Some opinions are the entire Ten Commandments was heard by all the Jews. Other opinions is they heard the first two and couldn't take it anymore. It was just too much a gigantic spiritual experience. Very good question. How could there be different opinions? Because it's po actually, I think that it's possible that there were different people on different madregot. And some were spiritually ready to hear more and some spiritually ready to hear less. That's possible. I don't know. There's another small problem. Everybody here knows they're supposed to have emunah and bitachon. You're supposed to have emunah. You're supposed to have faith. Based on what I said, where's their faith? If I know it, and it's a historical fact, I might not know all the details... And you see in the Talmud, sometimes there's discussions about different things. There's even a discussion which day was the Torah was given. You're aware of that? If it was Vav Sivan or Zion Sivan, the sixth day or the seventh day of Sivan. But if I know this as a fact, what is the Rambam talking about when the Rambam says, Ani ma'amin be'emunah shleima, I believe with full belief. That the Torah we have in our hands was given to Moses and the Jews at Sinai. What am I saying that? What is Rambam talking about? I believe. The Torah doesn't say I believe. I know it. Bergstein just told me I know it, right? Not only that, the Torah says I know it. Whenever we're going to take out the Torah, we start with one pasuk. What's the Pasuk we start with? Before we open the ark. Ato horeso lo da'as ki Hashem hu hu elekim. Ein od milvado. What is the translation? That's a Pasuk, a verse in Devorim. Translation. Ato horeso, you have been shown, lo da'as, to know ki Hashem hu hu elekim. It doesn't say ato horeso la ha'amin, Ki Hashem Hu Elikim, you have been shown to believe that Hashem is. No. You know, it's Das. Open up the Sidur, Ashkenazi Sidur, Sfaradi Sidur, Taimani Sidur, whatever you want, because it's a pasuk. Atohar Esol Das. It's not Laha Amin. So where does Emuna come in? Where does belief come in? This is going to surprise you, but the translation of Emuna that they translated as belief is basically not a particularly good translation. You know, whenever you translate words from one language to the other, sometimes it loses something. You know, you ever try to tell somebody, on Shabbat, we're not allowed to work. And then they see you dragging tables from the upstairs synagogue down to the downstairs synagogue. And they say, I thought you're not allowed to work. That's not work. And then they switch on the light switch. And you say, oh, Shabbat, you can't do that. That's work. 
what are you, crazy? I flip on the light switch, that's work, and I drag the tables from upstairs to downstairs all day and I'm sweating away, that's not work? What are you, nuts? The answer is, work is a bad translation. It doesn't say in the Torah not to work on Shabbos. The Torah says, Lo sase kol milacha. It doesn't say, Lo sase kol avodah. Avodah is work, and Evet is a slave working away. The Torah's word for Shabbat, what's forbidden, is melacha. Melacha is from the Shoresh, Loach, Lamed Aleph Chof. It's the same Shoresh as Malach, an angel. Melacha, Malach. Melacha, work. Malach, angel. Same Shoresh, same word, how is that? The answer is, what's an angel? An angel is an entity that God sends to do a creative activity, fulfill something creative, fulfill a mission that is a creative activity. A malach. And what's a malacha? The creative activity. It has nothing to do with work. It has to do with creative <coughs> activity. And that's why schlepping and dragging the table is nothing creative about it. It's nothing. And switching on the light switch, or throwing a seed into the ground, or writing your name is creative activity. So it's best not to translate the word. Leave it. What do we not do Shabbat? We don't do Shabbat. Melacha. What's the translation of Melacha? Melacha. But what does it mean in English? Melacha. You're not going to get too far, right? Okay. But you have to explain it. It's a creative activity. It's not the American's concept of work. Oh, drag in the stender. <laughs> and there's old words like that. Many, many words like that. The same is our problem with the word emunah. Emunah comes from the shoresh, the short root, aleph, mem, nun. We're very, very familiar with that word. The word is from the word Amen. What we say when somebody says a bracha, Sha'akol Niyabid Varo, Amen. How's my Sfaradi? Good? Good. Yeah. Amen. Right? Umain. <laughs> so, what do we mean by that? What does the word mean? Let's look where the word is in the Torah. One place in the Torah, it says, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses says to Hashem, how can I carry these people? I'm carrying the Jewish people. This is in Bamidbar. Moses says, I carry the Jewish people. As an Oman, as a nursing mother, carries the nursing child. The nursing child is called a Yonek, it's nursing. And the mother is called Oman, is called this word like Omein. Why is the mother called that word Omein? Why could it be? The answer is because the child depends on the mother. It's a dependence. It's a trust. The same way in the Megillah, it says that Mordechai raised Esther. And the word in the Megillah is Vayhi Omein et Hadassah. What was he Omein? What's Omein? She depended on him. He was her supporter. I'll tell you it even more. What do you say every day in the tefillah? In the tefillah every day we say the following words. And everyone in this room says it. Umalchuto ve'emunato la'ad kayemet. Hashem's kingship and his emuno is eternal. Translate that emuna to be belief. Hashem believes. Oh, thank you. Hashem believes? Hashem believes in who? In himself? What are you talking about? The translation of Malchuso ve'emunato, emunato means his dependability. I'll bring you even a bigger proof. You say modani in the morning. You're awake already, your eyes are open, yeah. Modani lefanecha, I thank you Hashem, shechazat abid nishmati, that you brought back my neshama, you gave me back a neshama, I didn't wake up dead. Didn't not wake up, or wake up dead, whatever. Rabba <laughs> emunatecha. What do those two last words mean? Rabba, it is so great. Emunatecha, your emuna. Huh? We're talking to Hashem. Your emuna, your belief is so gigantic. 
doesn't even fit. Doesn't make sense. What are we saying? We're saying, Rabbah, gigantic is emunatecha, your dependability. We can rely on you. We can depend on you. There's many other examples too. Now let's come to the Rambam. Rambam. I believe in full belief that the Torah is from Moshe Rabbeinu. I don't believe. I know it. I knew it before Bergstein made his speech. You know it. So what am I saying? There's two things. There's knowing it and there's depending on it. There's knowing it in your mind and then there's doing it in action every second of your life. Because sometimes somebody knows something, but they don't do it. I know that, you know, fatty meats and sugary sodas and garbage nosh is not healthy. I know it. But then I eat it anyway. Why? You know you're going to just get fat and get cholesterol and get who knows what else. Why are you doing it? I know it's not healthy, but I do different. There can be people who may know, yeah, Torah, Torah, Sinai, yeah, Torah, Torah, evidence, proof, absolute. But then there's not an action. They don't live their lives like that. The Rambam is saying the next step. You know, you don't need me, Rambam, for, uh, for, to know about Torah. Because you know it from Sinai, you know it from evidence, you know it from your parents, you know it, it's been handed down, unique in the world, the national revelation, no one else has it. Now what are you doing with it? To that we say, I depend on it. I trust in it. With full trust. I trust in it and I act like that in my life. Otherwise it doesn't even make sense. What's emunah shleima? If it's belief, full belief, complete belief, not half belief. There's no such thing as half belief. You know, 23 hours a day you say to your limb and one hour you bow down to the idol. Just in case. You know, just in case. That's insanity. Animamin means I depend. Be'amunah shleimah with full dependency. You know how that translates? That translates that if you have an interview for a job, you haven't had a job in six months, you need a job desperately, you come to the interview, the interview is in the winter time at 5 p.m. You're standing in front of the door of this big company in Manhattan. You're about to go into the interview. And you realize it's almost night. Oh! I didn't say mincha yet. I didn't daven mincha yet. What am I going to do? If I go away to a corner and stand and daven mincha for 10 minutes, I'm going to miss my interview. I'm not going to get the job. But if I wait and I go into the interview, I'm not going to be able to say mincha today. What do you do? The person who really means ani ma'amin be'amunah shleimah, not I believe. I depend with full dependency on Hashem. I depend with full dependency that the Torah is real. That's not where my money's coming from. That's not where my panasa is coming from, from the interview. My panasa is coming from Hashem. I go Davin Mincha. There'll be a bigger and a better job somewhere else. And if there won't be, doesn't matter either. Because my connection with Hashem is more. That's an imamim, but munash now, I know I talked about a lot of giant things here, and it has to settle a little bit. And, you know, many times people feel, you know, this is hard to put this all together. Who am I to put it all together? These are some kind of high madrigot, high, uh, you know, high, high levels of performance. Nobody's required to be perfect. Nobody's required to finish everything. You're required to do the best you can. We're required to work on our emunah, to work on our yidiyah, to work on understanding of Torah. Each mitzvah that we do, each bracha that we make, each tehillim, one chapter of tehillim that we say, is great, is gigantic, is fantastic. 
If somebody never said to Helim till today, and they're 40 years old, and they're never going to say to Helim the rest of their lives till they're 120 years old, and one day they take out one Siddur and say one chapter of Tehillim, fantastic. They missed all the rest of their life? That's like a shame. It's a shame. But that doesn't minimize this. Because this shows I'm dependent on Hashem. At this moment, I have a moment, my whole life is this moment. The Talmud says, Yesh konesh alama Some people can acquire eternity in one hour. It's their hour. It's their time. It's their chance now. But you've got to believe in yourself too. I want to conclude with a Hasidish story. No problem with that, right? Anybody has a problem with a Hasidish story? No. Okay. There was once a great Hasidic Rebbe. And the Hasidic Rebbe went out with the Hasidim to say Kiddush Levona. For those who might not be aware, especially the women maybe, Kiddush Levona is said once a month when there's a new moon, different customs, some people after three days after a new moon, seven days after a new moon, doesn't matter. And usually on Motzai Shabbat, on Saturday night after Shabbat ends, if possible, if not, the weekdays you can do it too. One thing you got to have, a clear night. You can't have a cloudy night. If you have a cloudy night, the moon, you can't see the moon, you can't say the bracha. The bracha has to be on a clear moon. When the moon is growing, beginning of the Jewish month, you go outside. The story is that that great Hasidic rabbi went outside with his followers, hundreds of Hasidim, hundreds of congregants, and they go outside with their prayer books, with the Sidurim, to say Kiddush Levana, to say the bracha on the Levana, on the moon. And it's cloudy. And, it's, and the moon is not clear. It's just a little cloudy. It goes in and out of the clouds. We don't know. The Hasidic rabbi says to his attendant, run downstairs into the synagogue and bring me up a clean white towel. He runs down, gets the clean white towel, comes running back upstairs out into the street, gives the Rebbe the white towel. The Rebbe opens up the white towel and he starts flopping it toward the sky. Like the women do if they burn something and the smoke detector went off. He starts flapping it toward the sky. You know, like trying to blow the clouds away with his towel. And the clouds start dissipating. And the clouds go away. And it's a clear, beautiful night. And he puts down the towel. And everybody says, the bracha. And they're so happy. They come back into the synagogue. They dance. They have a little lechayim, a little, you know, drink. Lekavod, the levana, the mitzvah. Everybody's so happy. Everybody goes home. And the Rebbe is left with his attendant standing in the front of the synagogue. And the attendant says to the Rebbe, Rebbe, oh, what a miracle. Wow, Rebbe, I never saw such a thing. You took the towel, you shook the towel, and the, the clouds started dispersing. Wow, Rebbe, you must be so holy. And the Rebbe says to him, oh, oh, what should I tell you? Really, I'm such a failure. Rebbe, how can you say you're a failure? Look what you did. I have to tell you, my father, Alava Shalom, the old Rebbe, could do the same thing, getting rid of the clouds without the towel. <laughs> I need to use a towel. Sometimes we look at ourselves the same way. Our grandparents... Our rabbis, somebody in the neighborhood who's a Torah scholar, whoa, their mitzvot, they're great. They have emunah, they have bitachon, they have yidiyah, they know the Torah, they believe, they're attached, shavuot. All I am is a cheesecake. No. Don't look at yourself the way that rabbi looked at himself. Everybody counts. Everybody counts. 600,000 Jews at Sinai, the males alone, never mind the women and the younger and the older, and everybody needed to be there. Everybody has a letter in the Torah. We're coming to Shavuot. We're marching toward it in the Sefirat HaOmer. We heard tonight 
an eye-opener about Sinai being real. Did we prove it? No. There is no such thing as proof. Do we need to prove it? No. We don't need to prove China exists. We need to have enough evidence that China exists. Because when I asked everybody, you've never been to China, but you know it's there, you know it's real, everybody says yes, based on the evidence. Even sitting in Forest Hills, you know China is real. Even sitting in Forest Hills, if you want to, you will know and can know that Sinai is real, the Torah is the emet of the world, and we have the opportunity during our lifetimes to become Torah Jews, each one according to their abilities. If you need a towel to make the skies clear, use the towel. Doesn't matter. If you need to hang on to somebody else, and you need somebody for chizuk, and you need chazak to make you have chizuk, that's fine. That's what they're here for. Baruch Hashem doing it very, very successfully. Hashem should bless and give bracha to everyone in this room that they should be zocher, they should merit to everything that the Holy Talmud says about Shavuot, which is a renewal of the Torah, which also is refuah shlema, because it says that when the Jews were at Sinai, everyone was cured and healed of all their ailments. Poverty is also an ailment. Everybody should have panasah berevach, they should have sustenance, they should have happiness, simcha, bracha, in the merit of sitting in this holy shul, and in the merit of coming to be mischazek with chazak, vechazak, vechazak, v'nischazek, lekrat matan Torah, amen.